I look back at those days with nostalgic sighs. As I get older, the time really flies. So come, my friend, come with me, back to where our memories be. I have lived here for 77 years, and I love the place. My name is William Gabb, and I come from Cum Sophia, New Tridiga. I love the place so much that I have written 10 books about it, and I've also run uh, a charity for 25 years for the handicapped in the district. Let's climb above the splendour of the streets we once knew, where most are all gone, they've only left a few. Let's search for the sights and the sounds that are there in our minds. Come with me, my friend, let's see what we can find. I was born in 1941 in the house across the road. It was a three-storey house and it was riddled with cockroaches. There was no electricity and we went to bed by candlelight. My first memories of when I was a young boy was my father coming up Comsevirg Road with a rifle on his, his hand and a kit bag on his back. He was on his way back from Dunkirk. Right. Five years later, my father bought a house across the road and I lived here then for the next 25 years. It was a nice place to live. We lived opposite Bethania Chapel, which on a Sunday was packed out morning, afternoon and night. And I attended this chapel until I was 16. We'll go back to the friendliest people you could ever meet in the old terrace houses, street after street. This is the site of the, of the Queen's Hotel. The Queen's Hotel was built in about 1860. It was a huge hotel with 22 bedrooms at the top and a bar down the bottom. When I got married, I had my reception in the Queen Vic and it didn't cost me a penny. The streets full of children all playing their games and such friendly neighbours remember their names. There was Heinem and Einan, Cleavy and Keach, just some of the names that lived in our street. I left school at 15 and started down the pit. A week later, I was in for a shock. They put me in the, in, in, in the bond and dropped me down the shaft and frightened me to death. But then it got worse. It was a dangerous job underground. Health and safety wasn't prevalent in them days. There was a thick dust, but no masks. Terrible noises and no earmuffs. And you just had to make do with what you had. If you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to walk about two miles or make do wherever you was. I remember once I had an accident on the ground and the roof collapsed on me and I was covered up to my neck in coal. They dug me out and told me to go back in the gob to have a sandwich and a drop of water. But I had injured my leg and I wanted to go home. To get to pit bottom was two miles. But one of the old colliers shouted to me, Bill, there's a shortcut if you want to go. So he directed me to this old road workings, which was about five foot high. And I started to walk down there. And I was walking in six inches of cockroaches. And I hunched my, hunched my back because of the height and they were dropping on the back of my neck. This was the straw that killed the camel's back. I went up the pit, and the following week, I joined the army. Remember then the old lower road with Jenkins, Haywood, and Price who would stick together through thick and thin. They were all so friendly and nice. I left Kumsevier Station with my mother crying and my uncle Tom saying, Hi boy, you broke your mother's heart, now they'll break yours. I was posted from York then to Germany, to the notorious Belsen Bergen camp, where 135,000 people died. I spent six months there, and it was the worst six months of my life. But six 
miles up the road. Elvis Presley was stationed doing his national service. And one day I had a detail to take a lorry full of bridges to his camp. And I got all excited because I thought, this is my chance to meet Elvis. I got to the camp gate, handed my detail into the guard on the gate, and I said, I whispered to him, is Elvis in? And he said, them two lorries you just passed in the drive, he was in one of them, and he's gone on the manoeuvre for six weeks. I came from there, sadly disappointed that I never met him. After I'd done my six months training in the army, they gave me a job on the regimental police, which was an interesting job because it involved me uh, picking people up for being AWOL, which is absent without leave. You'd be given a warrant and they send you all anywhere over the country. One particular one I remember was I had to go to Scotland Yard. I knocked the door of Scotland Yard and handed them this warrant for a fella. They handed me the bloke over. I took him back to the camp. He threatened to throw me off the train because he didn't like Welshmen. He was a big hunk of a fella. And I later found out that he was one of the Cray, the Cray uh, gang from the East End of London. And why he was doing his national servant service he had gone in on a false name because what they did then, the Cray brothers and, and the gangs, they would threaten people who owed them money. You either give us the money or you go in and do my national service. And this was, this was happening regular. I took that man on his court martial and he had two years jail. Yes, my friend, we'll remember and behold the steam from the engines of old, where they pilfered the coal from the wagons to keep warm and protect from the cold. I spent four years in the army. I had learned a trade in the army as a bricklayer. So I went to, to work for a firm then who was building churches. And one particular church I remember was on top of the mountain in Pontypridd. 10 o'clock one morning, we looked down into the valley. It was full of fog, but we could hear sirens everywhere. And then it came over the radio that the, the tip had slipped in our van. I ordered my eight men into the van. We threw the tools in, and we spent the day up there helping to rescue the people who got killed there. And that was the saddest day of my life. And it changed my opinion on religion also. I thought, if there's a God, why did he punish these small children? And I could never get over that fact. Where women would linger, fags all the light, an old man will wore dye cups from morning till night. A friend of mine was suffering from cancer and we started an organisation called Avril's Walk. That was an annual walk from Neutrotega to Bargoyde once a year, which collected money for the Lindra Hospital. To date, that fund has collected nearly £100,000. Avril was the person I started to write for. I wrote poems for her to comfort her in her illness. I went on then to write poem books, and from there on, I wrote 10 books, 10 novels about Neutralia and District. With a friend, I set up a charity organisation called the Neutralega Chairmobile Fund, which I was the chairman for five, 25 years. In that time, 
We collected enough money for 22 electric wheelchairs and gave thousands and thousands of pounds to the health centre for handicapped aids. My interests now are with the living room, which is the Christian Cafe, set up on White Rose Way. We have various functions there, like poetry nights, quiz nights, and the coffee is welcoming to anyone who goes there. My name's Alan Gab, and I'm Billy Gab's oldest son. He's a, he's a lovely man, very giving, and me and him are very, very close, very close. And I could wish for a better father. And I do like the way he is, passionate about his history. He's well-traveled, he's a well-rounded man. He's done so much in his life. I, I, he's full of information. He is always constantly out. He can't stay in the house from 12 o'clock in the afternoon till 8 o'clock in the night. You've got to find him. I've been a very good friend of Bill probably for oh, 10, 15 years. I knew him a lot further back, but we've been particularly friendly over the last 10 years or more. Um, a character, and there aren't many characters left today. Um, I've known Bill, I say, 10, 15 years quite well. Bill pops in to see me nearly every um, Sunday evening, and we sit and have a chat for a, an hour and a half, two hours perhaps, and we usually put the worlds to right. Um, good friend, very good friend, and um, you couldn't wish for anyone better as a friend. I see he puts a lot into the community. He did an awful lot for the community. Because Bill has been involved in various things over the years. Um, he doesn't do quite as much now, and a lot of what you do is not always appreciated. But we have a good community spirit here, and someone has to sort of try and keep the community going. With shifting curtains and shadows just gone, searching for gossip that they could pass on. This bridge was actually built with money left over from a grant they had to build the resource centre. It was an idea of the committee to use surplus money and put this as a reminder of the colliery. This is the Elliot's Colliery Museum. It was built about 11 years ago with, with money from the Objective One Heritage Funds and the local council. It was built to the sum of £2,600,000. Welcome to Elliot's Colliery Museum, a brilliant example of Victorian engineering. The winding engine was built in 1891 and has a 2,000 horsepower. It raised men on coal for nearly a century, and after its closure in 1967, it fell into decline. I wrote a poem relating to this and it's the following. Cruel this sight before my eyes, as cruel a sight could be. This vibrant place of industry, ignored was plain to see. Black the cloak that covered all, mixed, mixed sparse with rustic red, looking like an empty tomb, now silent, cold and dead. Frames of wood held broken glass, door unhinged fell free. Weeds weaved from the damaged roof through holes where the slate should be. Great wheel now still and silent, no more to spin and sing. Now just a place to visit, a monumental thing. Well, why, I, why I could never understand the people of this area voting to leave the European market is the fact that all these Welsh Valleys be benefited from the Objective One Fund from Europe. They injected millions of, millions of pounds into these valleys, including Neutronia, who benefited 31, 31 million pounds. 
from it. The winding house was derelict and I was approached to see whether we could do something to renovate it. Over the next 10 years, the friends and volunteers at the winding house got together and we eventually rose £2,600,000 to build what we've got now as a fine museum. What worries me most about this area is the fact there's nothing here. It'd have died in situ, like most of the mining areas in these valleys. There's only one person working here now, and it will be a shame because the winding house was brought back from decline, so the friends and volunteers, all their, all their work would be in vain. So I don't want it to close, but it's looking dodgy. But emerging, my friend, is a new low road. Let's hope it will shape with the same friendly code where people will pull together and rally the second time round in our Strawberry Valley.